where you've been. There's no reason. Very little time to reflect in life. Which is why we do these things. Which is why we have these conversations. Yep, I know, man. Uh, I I I've, I've stopped reading, uh, and I'm not liking it at all. Uh, I'm just not. Um, um not used to zooming out for a long period of time like i'm i'm having equal amount of zoom out and zoom in in life and i've been too zoomed in which means i feel i'm getting dumber in life <laughs> too, much, <laughs> too much inflow and not enough time to analyze everything basically. that's coming in basically mm. uh and and uh, actually i have a slightly different issue i i like to be in the future yeah and things that force me to come back to present make me snappier uh and because i rather be in the future and imagine the future mm. um and predict the future versus or build the future versus get stuck in ye hua kal ye hua type of issues so i'm also going through that yeah a, lo- a lot of people would love to live in the future but they don't have the luxury of doing so because the present there are too many threats in the present so if you can somehow arrange a situation where you can live in the future and be safe that's a job well done yeah that's an interesting thing i i have found that only possible in two situations one uh i force myself out of my karma bhumi so place i work and if you go to another city it automatically forces you to not feel that number one yeah number 2 uh, i have seen uh, uh like creating uh, a discussion with somebody where even if it's not your problem you are going to somebody else's problem and you can zoom out through their surrogate uh experience where you can kind of have this temporary relief from your world because your your future and past is connected but when you are doing it for somebody else it's not so connected if you are if you are living across all these different time zones then uh, of course it is going to take a mental load on you which is why most people prefer to live in the present yeah. here and now jo samne hai jo problem saan mein hai wo solve karo khush raho I, I, i it's funny i call it uh, the behavior of mobile notifications right so most people live their life ke jo notification aaya wo app khol do and Correct. keep going in that direction it takes deliberate effort to say i will not respond to the notifications but i will open the app i want and spend the time on what i want mm-hmm. uh, but the easiest behavior is to jo i a notification usko respond kar do yeah i remember asking once uh, uh that what would indian spend most money on uh uh kids education medical emergency uh, or something and <laughs> I I mean three four things I had written and I, and I think the best comment was whatever happens first. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I I would have thought that it is a child's wedding because traditionally that has been very very important. I know but the thing is when you are emotional society you respond to the first emotional stimuli. Hmm. So I believe as a society we keep collecting 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 Collecting, 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 and then there is this event where we go mm. and collect, 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 collect. So we operate in spurts and not deliberate choices, uh, and like go all in on those things, right? And so we, yeah, we have somehow managed to justify that also. Like we have these festivals that uh, allow us, that, you know, that give us moral, res- uh, moral free way to spend. Yeah. Chalo, Diwali hai, Holi hai. Of course, you have to spend. Too for many things. We go and study history. You will find many festivals which were allowing you to have complete debaucherous behavior, right? Yeah. So you go to history of Saturnalia, which was eventually made into Christmas and so on and so forth. It was a society thing where you could uh, uh, do any kind of morally incorrect behavior, and it was considered to be uh, maf, sure. right? So I think. Uh, i think it's a human dilemma to kind of hold 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 and have your cheat days mm. it comes down from fear right because we've come from this uh, time of scarcity 
we don't really know when we will run out of things. So as a collective, we are so scared of losing out. We are so scared of running out of friends, of power, of food. How do you get over that? How do you convince your brain that, hey, it's okay, times have changed? I don't think you can make your brain do anything till you have time to pause and reflect. Mm. Uh, because we are all on automatic mode. Right? We are all in a loop that is operating on automatic mode and we are just like, it's a game and the game can't end. The game doesn't end. The game keeps moving. And I think uh, when you pause, when you use, like go through this really uh, big pause, right? And, and I think some of the societies figured out how to do pauses more cautiously. For example, the word vacation comes from vacate. Mm. Uh, and many European societies take a very long break uh, where they vacate themselves for a month or so, or read books, like really reset, right? Mm. But for us, vacation is tourism, where we go even more crazy and we come more tired back from our vacation because it was not vacate, it was explore. Yeah, so yeah. we call it vacation, but we are mostly doing exploration in our vacations. Yeah. So it's an interesting I phenomena by itself. In fact, a vacation where you actually do nothing is often considered a waste of time that you spent all that money and you didn't click any pictures, you didn't meet anybody, you didn't yeah. see a single wonder of the world. What did you yeah. do? I, I actually do that. I have stopped taking a picture for vacations over the last few years, like four or five years. I just don't take any picture. Zero uh, pictures. Zero pictures. And... Uh, uh, I am naturally sleep better when I'm on vacation. Uh, I don't know why. There's almost a, a reset to your brain that says, okay, uh, you don't have to really, and, and you can sleep well. Uh, but I think the thing is that it's not normal for people to say, um, oh shit, like, well, let's do this. Let's explore this for them. And I, I'm not against that format. It's just that it depends on how crazy your life is. Uh, for a lot of people, vacation is when their life becomes exciting. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of people, their life is too exciting for their vacations to not be exciting. Uh. <laughs> there is a beautiful irony in what you just said. Because you said that you live in the future. But that is the exact reason why people take pictures. Yep. They want to remember this. They want to <laughs> go back to this moment in the future. And somehow on vacation, you are in the live in the moment zone. I think most people are trying to go back to their past and not to their future. They are trying to collect things to like and appreciate in their future. Uh, for example, let's say you are out at a music show and you are like Instagram stories nonstop. Sure. Like, let me tell my friends I'm at the school place. I'm on the fourth row in this music show and let them see how cool I am. <laughs> but you're missing that experience. And, and, uh, I used to also do that earlier. I was like, oh, cool. I, I can I can post stories and, and I would do it. Right. And uh, therefore, I've just disconnected uh, sharing what's going on with my life uh, as a social update uh, because it steals you from that moment uh, and it does not register. Uh, uh, it's always about let me go back to those stories. Let me go back to that post. Versus let me go back to that memory in your head, which is now largely defined by the pictures and stories you clicked. And I'm, I'm okay with, I'm, I'm not saying that people who do that is not a good thing. It's just that I feel that being in that moment and that experience is way more valuable than collecting uh, uh, aggressively uh, everything. Uh, mm. And I think people do this for different things. For example, uh, I, I love taking a screenshot of a great thought or uh, sharing a thing or, or like something uh, I, I, my collection is moved, moved to a different topic that I want to collect this thought, have that uh, thing captured, have this inspiration captured uh, versus uh, a lot of these things, which are just uh, visual stimuli in some ways uh, yeah. uh, versus a mental stimuli, which can be done through words, mm. which can be done through, uh, other things and and again not judging anybody's choices over here uh, to me 
uh, I've come to a realization that to me, wicket uh, only works when I'm not trying to collect and feel anxious about, oh shit, I missed this moment or, oh shit, I did not take a picture of this great fish when I was snorkeling and like, sure. like collect, 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 collect. Uh, so and and I, I, the point I made about interesting life uh, otherwise makes you want to make your life boring once in a while and boring life once in a while wants to make uh, your life interesting. For a lot of people, going on vacation is only when their life becomes exciting. Mm. So you mean an escapism? It's an escapism, right? Like or cinema for them yeah. is an escapism. So, no. So here's the thing: the difference between collecting and holding is, I feel that collecting inherently has a sense of purpose, whereas holding comes out of fear. Yeah. So if you're collecting, you what you're saying is that you know where this is going to go. You already have a slot prepared in your mind, in your house, in your room, where this is going to fit in. Whereas holding is le lete, fir baad mein dekhenge. Kyunki agar nahi mila to kya hoga? I think holding comes from also resource constrained societies, right? So yeah. uh, all resource constrained societies have a natural tendency of holding. Like uh, I make fun of people who collect uh, plastic bags in their drawer, right? It's a very common behavior you see in India. Oh, yes. Uh, but interestingly, what you notice is that uh, Indians love to collect things that you can store stuff in. Yeah. Storage. You're holding storage space. Yeah. And, and they don't throw away any bag, any dabba, any this where you can potentially store something. Uh, shoe boxes. Shoe boxes, bags, gift bags, uh, plastic bag, grocery bag. Uh, like many households in India will have tons and tons and tons of storage stuff kept. Uh, and you ask them why and they don't know why they do that, but they do that. Uh, kaam aega. And this whole thing of kaam aega, uh, drives the hoarding mindset. Uh, I think it's pronounced in a few societies uh, where resource constraints are real, uh, but it's it's kind of corrosive in some ways because you are just in this constant mode. Let me convert this into some storage, some hoarding, uh, and I, I'm sure it borderlines on some disorder. Uh, uh, but it, it 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 is around fear. The problem is that the other side of it is also quite bad because when you look at the US where things aren't hoarded in fact everything is disposable everything is uh, put back into the environment there uh, it has to get collected somewhere so then the environment takes a toll yeah I think uh, in general if you study an interesting phenomena uh, many many years ago the number of total number of SKUs uh, a tribe had was probably 200 to 250. Okay. Right. And, and if you study average household now, let's say an affluent household mm. would probably have at least 4,000 to 5,000 SKUs. For sure. Right. And what are these SKUs? They are just products which are cutted from combination of energy and some matter of the earth. And you formed it into a laptop, you formed into a book, you formed it into a glass and this lamp and this mirror. And then you're like, constantly converting energy and making these products into something. And I, I feel that uh, this constant need to constantly reshape the planet to suit uh, this is, a, is an interesting problem by itself. And, and uh, there's no end to human needs. And then you're like, oh, let me do this on my vacation home. And let me <laughs> get this done in something else. And then let my office and then this and that. And I think, uh, therefore, uh, like in many societies, minimalistic mindset has come in because it's an evolved version of saying that, hey, control your SKUs and there is no end to it. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, many uh, of people who have slightly evolved mindset buy products that have no signaling value in it, right? There are no labels, there is no logo, mm. none of that. So you, they, they kind of get out of the trap of trying to constantly signal, yeah. right? Oh, this is 
not a branded product. This is not a thing. And I think we are stuck in signaling uh, constantly, uh, which uh, is trying to appeal to newer and newer cohorts, right? Like first you wanted to be cool, let's say in doctors and then poets, and then now have a next audience and then you will have somebody else. And then you will be like, oh, I want to get applause from other people who have better podcasts and so on and so forth. And right. There is no end. And I think same thing happens in products, right? Like, oh, once I have this, once I have this penthouse, once I have this, mm. once I have this vacation, once I have this. And I think this is the true bane of a, a human society that they just kind of yeah. does not uh, end. The hedonic treadmill, my friend. Yep. Yep. You are, uh, you are on it. Your brain is on it. You cannot get out of it until and unless we say that... Uh, happiness isn't really uh, something that you are chasing see happiness uh, truly can be long lasting if you love and desire everything that you already have hmm. but the problem is the word desire excludes hmm. what you already have yeah yeah when you said signaling you immediately open the door to social contracts because all of signaling comes from there because of our need for each other. We are living in a society where we require each other for our own survival. So at its essence, signaling is a way of ensuring our own survival. It's more than that, right? Uh, if you think about the true evolutionary reasons of signaling is to have superior mating success, mm -hmm. superior progeny success, superior survival and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all signaling are telling the other person that, hey, I should be paying attention to this person, right? Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, if somebody comes in your other inbox in Instagram, which has 24 followers, yeah. your response is going to be different or you may not even respond to somebody who has 15,000 followers. Yeah. But guess what? What if they had blue tick? So the thing is that the yeah. signaling is nothing but our mechanism to find out where is it worthy to spend our energy yeah, which is likely to increase our social status as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, like, if you notice a pattern that across all mammals, uh, uh, the, the the females like to uh, the, the 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 gender that has to take the biggest burden of uh, raising an offspring, right? Like the one who has to burn more energy uh, maintaining, they yeah. naturally are more. Uh, likely to pick somebody who tends to burn less energy for every energy that they or, or less calories for every calories they earn yeah. uh, and, and they're naturally more desirable and, and that is signaling right so a peacock is doing that by signaling that I can waste energy uh, mm. a, a lion is doing that by having a furry body in heat saying that I can waste this energy uh, yeah. a person with Mercedes is showing that by saying that I can have one uh, kilometer per liter average and I can waste. So wastage has yeah. a signaling value. Yeah, uh, it shows that I have so much reserve that yes. I can I can withstand pain. I can withstand adversity. So you should be with me. I think that's one thing that most people don't understand that wastage has a utility value. Mm. Now, the problem is we are all connected, hyper-connected monkeys now. Now, imagine what's happening. Said, yeah. uh, earlier, you would want to appeal to a group of people. For example, I was born in a time where dating was done, where internet did not exist. So your social circle was at best 30, 40 people. Yeah. At, at best, maybe 100. And you had to win in that 100 with some social hierarchy. Correct. Now, everybody is connected in this hyper-connected world and we are trying to find the next best one, right, in whatever ways. Uh, let's take an example, right? Uh, I was talking to some founders who run dating apps and uh, on an average, uh, women right swipe one out of ten. All right. But unfortunately, all of them are right swiping on the same people. <laughs> now, this person is 
getting so much demand that they are not able to conclude and mm. commit to a relationship right because they have so many choices and the choices don't end Correct. so the only way you can break this game theory problem is that uh women should just drop off social media uh sorry or uh, dating apps mm. because then the circles will become small and the desirable candidates do not have an unlimited universe uh, to pick from sure but then isn't the platform already skewed in favor of men like aren't there already more men anyway on these platforms I, it is because of the internet access and shame attached to it but i've had to right. a phenomena it's right. not uh bad as bad as this but uh, women in general do not, not want to be seen on dating apps compared to men uh, right. because they want to appear to be more uh, elegant in their approach towards it and this is what comes from i've spoken to multiple founders and product yeah. people in dating companies and it's interesting because uh being choosy is a good trait in mm. general right uh but i think being available on a dating platform uh, signals uh sometimes in some societies that hey how come you came over here like you are so special why would you need a dating app <laughs> So Kunal what is really interesting to me is that there are certain characteristics that human beings have formed over the years which applies to everything whether it is a colonial expansion or whether it is relationships yeah which is that you you instinctively want to explore and you also instinctively want to set up camp yeah so you want to build a good base a solid base that nobody else can attack and as soon as you have that you want to explore you want to expand your territory yeah once you've expanded you again want to set up camp i see this in relationships all the time so somebody who is single uh, who has the opportunity to explore wants to set up camp wants the wants the safety and the comfort of a relationship somebody who's been in a long term relationship let me explore let me see what else is out there yeah and i think uh, the curse that we are now living is that we have the ability to be so many different people in so many different boxes hmm so you are literally building bubbles for yourself yeah and and in the physical world you had to be one person with one personality and one style and one approach and and you cannot have violation of narrative in a different group so yeah. you behave in a certain group you maintained a narrative because if people saw you to be this extremely cute and bubbly person in one group and extremely reserved in another group you'll be like who are you yeah. uh, and therefore you never met this group let this group meet but yeah. now every single inbox every single dm you have the opportunity to be a different person wow uh, which allows you to constantly remain interesting for the other party uh and constantly find new people who you could be interesting to yeah. and i often feel that uh people get bored out of a relationship when somebody becomes boring because they have nothing new that you cannot pattern detect right yeah. uh i had read an interesting study where it says that uh kids can watch a cartoon movie for 20 times uh because they can't pattern recognize and every time they find something new in it mm -hmm. right but adults we can watch one movie and we can't find new patterns so we don't like that but therefore we need complicated things like christopher nolan's movie where you can discover new things every time you watch something right yeah also that is a two time watch capabilities because you can't figure out all the patterns in the first by right. time right right same way human beings are now insanely predictable mm. so therefore they are not interesting because we are driven through this i need to constantly have dopamine uh, and interesting stuff coming in my short video channels and all of that and i'm like yeah. looking for interesting 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 and everybody becomes boring yeah because yeah school. if you're scrolling through human beings like you're scrolling through youtube then how long a human being can capture your attention is is it can be algorithmized like yeah. how good is their thumbnail so to speak how good is their trailer um, how yeah and i think you know what is interesting uh if you treat a human being as a solution to your boredom hmm. then i can tell you one thing for sure 
that all solutions of boredom eventually become boredom mm. right the song that you loved to kill your boredom becomes boring yeah. the uh the club that you love to go to party to kill your boredom becomes boring so uh every interesting thing that was created in your life to kill your boredom eventually becomes boring i read this line uh, it was in this book uh, man search for meaning mm-hmm. victor frankl so the line was that boredom is man's awareness of the passage of time brilliant so just being aware of time and being aware of our own impending mortality even for a second gives us so much of anxiety fills us with so much fear that we would just reach out and grab on to whatever it takes to help us forget that we are eventually going to die it's so interesting uh, i believe that a lot of our coping mechanisms are born out of some version of trauma that we are escaping constantly right yeah. and and uh, these are all coping mechanisms in some ways or the other where yeah i mean most people lost their mind during covid because like they had to meet themselves <laughs> it's a scary yeah. thing and many yeah. of them didn't like what they saw yeah and and uh, not many people would love to meet themselves if they ever met themselves uh mm. and i that think that was a that was a popular question at one point at would you date you <laughs> interesting yeah <laughs> and 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 uh the 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 behavior to escape have many many uh, interpretation people escape uh the traumas like i think all versions of ocds are escapes uh one way or the other mm. and there are loops there are loops that we are stuck in because we have not resolved something and we are stuck in this loop and sometimes the loop has uh are very stringent for example you know i have been studying uh, all narcissistic dictators right and mm. uh and obviously the the russian war was a good uh uh place for me to research that why do people behave the way they do mm. and it was interesting to notice that across all narcissistic dictators there was one common pattern excessively abusive childhood from their father's side a male figure uh was extremely abusive or violent and dignity stripping for them right. the interesting point was uh, uh changes khan had the same thing to uh putin trump like all of them have a similar story right. so they create this narcissistic personality as a defense mechanism of that child who's constantly worried and yeah. that grandiose version of them kind of keeps growing right yeah uh uh interestingly the grandiose version constantly needs supply of attention that they will be okay with a negative supply so a lot of them go negative also because like acting out supply uh, is sapped from certain place so they will do something crazy that supply continues right yeah. and look at me look at me look at me is is important for them yeah. uh, and and it, another version i saw was patterns of all serial killers uh uh and i i'm obviously over generalizing to the point of largest correlation i don't know if, by no means tend to say that these are causations i don't know the causation i'm saying there are strong correlations mm. uh, one was a uh, extremely abusive dignity stripping moms okay uh and and it's an interesting pattern by itself that they all like 80 90% of them have similar thing and then uh i i i then i was obviously went down the rabbit hole to find out that if people who are uh in in a, a situation of let's say child abuse and and there was a study that was done that 70% of all people in the jail for you in uk for child abuse have a history of child abuse mm-hmm. so it's like we are just constantly repeating patterns of what we are oh, yeah. uh and and a lot of times i feel that these are all escape mechanism for dealing with the real pain uh that we felt yeah oh there is absolutely no doubt that when you look at your own life and you look at your the the instinctive responses that you give to certain things uh, all your defense mechanisms most of them have been formed in school yeah and for the rest of your life you are just living out different scripts of that same story you yeah, know your friend telling you something and if you behaved in a particular way in school and that worked that's what you are sticking with 
and you won't even realize that uh, you may have found fancier words for it. You may have found better clothes to guide it in, but it's essentially the same response. Very interesting. I think what I'm saying is that all coping mechanisms are just uh, elaborated and exaggerated later on. You know, yeah. interestingly, uh, I was talking to somebody um, in FMCG world and asked that what is the common connection uh, between people who are very good at sales? Mm. FMCG hires a lot of sales people, right? Like yeah. uh, uh, sales officers, area sales managers, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and an interesting observation was made by a friend of mine was uh, strict parents. <laughs> because what they did is that they still got what they wanted and they had a constant training at home mm. to persuade people who do not want what they desire. Right. So that has an element of sociopathic behavior. The ability to manipulate somebody without letting your own emotions into the picture right. forms forms the forms the basis of sociopathic behavior. Yeah, and I've been wondering on this line that what is persuasion and what is manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where does the line draw? And I think it's very hard to draw the line because the mechanics seems to be the same. But does it benefit one party or two parties? I think that's where I call it persuasion versus manipulation. Mm. Right. Uh, let's say I got you to do something that only benefits me uh, in your, in, uh, with, even though you had resistance is, is manipulation, but if it benefits both of us, then it's probably persuasion. So I think Interesting. it's a, I thought intent like, might have something to do with it. That's what I'm saying. Intent has to have a cost benefit effect, right? Mm. Like if I persuade you to do this, uh, then did it benefit both of us or not? Right. But if I manipulated you to do this, I'll give you an example. Right. I was once invited to a party. Right. Uh, and suddenly I was put on spot to just give a keynote. Yeah. So you are using a persuasion to come for a party and turning that into a manipulative behavior. Right. Uh, and you were wondering. And you weren't told that this is what yeah. is going to happen. Right. Right. So I think a lot of people. Uh, take that line uh, very mm. lightly uh, and and uh, often uh, do things that could make people doubt them. So there, this, this is a big thing that manipulation involves an element of falsehood. Persuasion might not. Persuasion might involve putting out facts in front of you that might convince you. Uh, I don't think facts often help uh, there are many, many mechanisms you can do, right? And there's a long list of how persuasion can work. For example, yeah. you can make them realize that it's not a decision that only they are taking, but many people are taking. You can create a social. Right. Uh, yeah. You can uh, make people understand uh, the benefit of benefit. Uh, for example, benefit is, oh, your kid will do well if they go to the school. But the benefit of benefit could be that if they do well in life, they could get admission into Ivy sure. League or you'll have social connection with other parents who are likely to be like you. And, and a lot of time persuasion requires multiple levels of uh, understanding of nuances. Uh, and I've noticed that best persuasive people tend to uh, aggregate themselves in industries which have the highest uh, margins, gross margins, uh, automatically attract people with high persuasion, right? So you'll see jewelry guys are a right. much better persuasion than let's say a grocery guy mm. uh, and so on and so forth, right? So I think uh, it automatically attracts the best of the best. So that could also be, that could also be because some things sell themselves. You don't really need a lot of persuasion to sell grocery. Uh, it depends. For example, you are selling this new cool toothpaste, uh, which is just come to the market and mm. uh, it's harder for you to sell. Uh, in fact, you notice one thing at a chemist, uh, all the products kept in the front, yeah. are usually with much higher gross margins than the products kept behind, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because they are reducing one step uh, for you to engage in that product or be curious in that product. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about the social contracts of manipulation and persuasion, it brings us all the way back to the topic of our conversation which is trust 
when we when we look at trust and i've been thinking about this since afternoon since you messaged me about this topic i was i was kind of struck by how trust is the fabric that all of this is weaved in yeah Ev- everything is sort of built on that fabric yeah so where do we even start talking about this i think starts from what is the benefit of trust right mm. uh uh and why do we need trust for example i a trust requires another person yes uh so for, by design trust is a multiplayer game yeah it evolved to it evolved as a multiplayer game now the question is that how large of a cohort that you want to influence hmm uh challenges the level of trust you can play as a game right uh I'll, I'll give you a small example right uh i read somewhere that a lot of jewish people who came to the us after the persecution that happened yeah. world war for them uh chose professions uh that were likely to cause a huge amount of trust in them uh because they were persecuted for being money lenders in other societies which is not something that people like trustworthy yeah trustworthy so they chose professions like uh doctor and lawyer uh which are likely to appear as professions that are likely to protect your progeny or protect yourselves for that purpose receiving society and they were accepted right so naturally we like guardians and uh our protectors more than uh people who are likely to take our wealth away uh versus protect our wealth or protect our assets hmm. uh so i think uh, by by design uh you, you will see that when we are playing a large game you can create automatic trust uh uh yeah. by creating some of these mechanisms so this is very tribal in nature so if if there is say one particular community say there's one marwadi community who is well known for their jewelry business there is a there is a trust in the whole industry that tum is community se le lo sab kuch theek rahega everything is going to be fine that trust has been built over several years several generations in fact this this tribal nature will not go away and so every comu- every member of that community would then be expected to carry forward that trust yeah unless uh, you do what let's say tata group did with tanishk uh, they challenged that uh bring your jewelry from your local jeweler and check the quality in our machine over here right and suddenly people realized that the people they trusted never really gave them the highest quality mm-hmm. and and what happened because of this that the generational trust started breaking right and i think that's where you see uh, uh technology has a huge role to play uh on on how trust keeps migrating to places for example uh let's say uh historically something would have promised to i don't know give you better results in your education and then you empirically find something else to be better you start realizing that the previous method was actually not very good and you actually feel sure. cheated uh if you've been paying for it for a long period of time most mba students apparently <laughs> uh, the 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 thing about trust is that um uh, to me i i read a beautiful thing that trust is a space that is created for us to be vulnerable in hmm right yes i i don't need to worry about threat right uh yeah physical threat a uh, wealth threat anything of that nature right yeah and and therefore we feel extreme pain when there is a betrayal from person we trust because we lose a person or a space where we had historically been vulnerable yeah right and the biological punishment to us for making that judgment call is huge because if you think about it uh, when the resources are less we know that we have to compete with each other for resources yeah so logic says don't trust anyone that's the logical thing why would you trust another person when resources are less it is in their interest to cheat you and go away with whatever little there is and so the um, amount of 
evolutionary energy that has been set that has been spent in figuring out whom to trust is massive yeah unless you take the again the evolutionary biology lens and say that we naturally trust people up to our second cousin level right so the blood yeah. uh is thicker uh as a concept works in biology yeah. and i think we naturally trust uh I, I remember reading this in or watching this of Robert, Robert Sapolsky's uh, example of lions when they take over a pride as an alpha, uh, they kill the cubs because it gets the pride into uh, a heat and, and uh, therefore creates uh, a new new generational uh, progeny for them. But they do not kill the cubs only if it happens to be up to second cousin. Oh. So even for them, this is a big factor. And, and by the way, they, they sometimes they don't even know if that person was second cousin or not. They can smell. Mm. There's a strong correlation to trust and smell. Yeah. Uh, in animals that have been established, right? Yeah. That we can smell fear. We can smell trust. We can smell. Uh, uh, I, I had I'd read about uh, facial expressions and how there are some 56 muscles in the face, which uh, can have these micro twitches. And uh, even though we are not consciously aware of them, there are primitive centers in the brain that are constantly looking at somebody's face to figure out that can I trust this person or not. And so small things like shifty eyes and uh, no eye contact or looking away, all those things subconsciously make a difference. And all those body language uh, courses that people talk about, there is a certain basis to it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, no, like... In the past Bollywood movies, you would look at some villains and like, this villain. Hai. Ye villain hai. <laughs> right? And and, and the hero. Hai. And, and then uh, Shah Rukh Khan comes and tries to find his own space by a hero that acts like a villain. Right? He, he creates a new uh, a genre of in life. Right? And it was an interesting contrast that he played. Uh, but I think uh, beauty has a strong correlation to trust. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, there's been a lot of studies done on that. That we naturally trust beautiful people, beautiful things, a lot more than things that are not beautiful mm. or not symmetrical for that matter. Maybe we got it reversed. Maybe trust came first. Maybe trust came first. You're right. And and so you find trusting faces beautiful. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe trusting people could generically pick better and then over a period of time became beautiful. Right. Yeah. So there are certain things. Um, so, for example, color of the skin. Now, that is very subjective because uh, we would obviously trust people of your of the same color of your skin more. That is on an evolutionary basis. And that is kind of the basis for racism and all of those things, of course. So these are not logical. But I, I they come from this emotional I, space. I don't think it is simple, right? For example, Indians will trust people with white skin hmm. more than their own skin sometimes, right? And it comes from learned behavior, from social hierarchy. Yeah, saying that this is more trustworthy, less trustworthy, and so on and so forth. For hmm. example, uh, we will naturally not doubt a builder who appears to be very rich. And who's mm. selling a flat to us, and we will not question and do diligence on them. But mm. we naturally diligence somebody with a lower social status. And uh, uh, so, naturally, I've seen that uh, societies that tend to have power distance in their blood uh, naturally respect and don't mistrust people who are more mm. affluent or more powerful. Mm. Uh, whereas, exactly the opposite should be done. Uh, but it seems to be working the opposite way. Mm. And, and therefore, you notice an interesting pattern that. Uh, super apps, superstars, and super conglomerates only emerge in low trust societies. So, but, but I understand superstars, but what do you mean super apps? Like one app that does 25 things, and people trust that app to do 25 things. Right? Okay. So they have established some trust with that. Okay. And, and you will see a pattern on. Um, uh, Let's say Tata Group can launch a salt also, and people will buy mm. it. Jewelry also, and uh, chemists mm. use karenge because so every low trust society creates concentration of trust. Got it. 
in yeah. a few things. For example, ninety percent of Bollywood revenue comes from maybe twenty thirty people. Mm. Uh, and and uh, it's fascinating that uh, we we tend to trust a fewer amount of brands. Uh, and and trust a few because in a slow trust society this becomes harder and harder so it's it's example, like there is a compounding of trust so once you start yeah. trusting somebody it's easier to trust that person with one more responsibility yeah. rather than so wouldn't this happen in hiring also it it not naturally does right uh, actually let's take a simpler example let's not go into corporate world let's say mm. you get a domestic help who comes to home to clean mm. and they apparently do well and and you're liking it and they say hey uh do you mind if i wash your clothes also and you're like sure and do you mind if i cook for you you're like sure why can i buy groceries for you sure uh do you mind if i go and do your bank work sure. sure uh and therefore you notice one thing that uh a lot of families do get really pissed off when their help that they have had for many years don't come yeah uh because they have made these hundreds of micro configurations on this person mm. and that person doesn't come you don't like the new person because they can't understand hundreds of things that you have given them as yeah. instructions on yeah. how it should be and therefore uh, our investment in them starts pissing us off <laughs> uh, there there is a very good question that's come up in the chat prakar thanks for that uh, you've heard about the new iit iim shaadi scandal mm mm-hmm. so there is an there is a whole website that uh, allows people from iit and iim to find each other as partners to marry there is a lot of backlash for this saying that how could you create such a such a group i i all backlash of india is just hypocritical uh um first of all i don't think it's a new website i think it's been around for a while yeah it just made an ad for the first time plus <laughs> uh i was asking matrimonial uh websites product people that what happens mm. uh and they made an interesting observation to me saying that uh one gender looks for people of the other gender with higher income and one gender looks for people with lower income than their income consistently right now this is data across millions of searches right right and i don't think it will be different depending on which country it is but the thing is that um everybody wants to take a decision where they have lesser probability of failure right and and nobody wants to be in an environment where you get uh into a marriage situation with somebody who's likely to earn less than you or or not of the same status as you uh and i think uh, uh we naturally prefer uh uh some of these things and i think uh, all these labels what was the purpose of degrees if you exactly. go back to history of degrees you'll find out that they were nothing but a way for a person to evaluate a person and pick over other people right it, it was the earliest verified account it is now the only problem is everybody became verified account <laughs> because sabko degree mil gaya right so then you saying acha aapka degree ka color dark blue light blue right. because blue tick to sab ho gaya right right so you are saying shade of blue is going to be different and if the shade of blue is it is better i am is better you are basically saying that they're more likely to have higher incomes going forward compared yeah. to other people then like what's wrong why do we have to judge people yeah. uh, into this right uh, and i think uh, a lot of times the backlash is only done by people who are not uh, in that segment uh, let me give an ex- mm-hmm. uh, simpler example let's say i i create a building in uh, bombay which says that only people with iq 130 and above can stay here no way <laughs> right so they they do an iq test before you buy the house. yeah now now the first reaction that people will have in the here is that they'll try to know what's their iq hmm and they're like should will i qualify or not but let's say if you qualify you're like you'll be so proud to stay in that building yeah right but everybody who does not will have a backlash that how can you make a building like this 
mm. segregating based on IQ. Yeah. Um, it's a slippery slope, though, because at at some point it can go on to actual discrimination and. Uh, while we can sit and reason uh, out the uh, logic behind look at, look it, look at corporate world, right? It does so much of interview and hire people, right? So what is not discriminatory about it? Right. Uh, skills are discriminatory, right? Uh, uh, choices are discriminatory. Humans are constant discriminatory. Uh, it's just that when we are on the other side, we do not like it, mm. right? Uh, where the discrimination seems to benefit somebody, but historically. We've always had discriminatory. The human society has constantly been stratified. The stratification layers have constantly changed. Sometimes we had caste system. Sometimes we have degree system. Sometimes yeah. we'll have health system. Like Salary, so, many, yeah. so many versions of that. Uh, but human society will always stratify. Yeah. In IIT also there'll be some stratification. Ke IIT Bombay se ho, ke IIT Guwahati se ho, ke IIT se ho, ke IIT Delhi se ho, ke kis se ho, right? Yeah. Usme bhi jao ge. कौन से स्ट्रीम से हो फिर उसके बाद कौन सी जॉब करते हो कौन सा लोकेशन है पीएचडी टॉपिक क्या था कुछ तो एनीथिंग देयर इज नो देयर इज नो एंड टू स्ट्रेटिफिकेशन बिकॉज़ अह लेट्स लेट्स मूव अवे फ्रॉम अरेंज मैरिज एंड टॉक अबाउट अह वीसी इन्वेस्टमेंट्स राइट दैट वाज अ वेरी कॉमन थिंग दैट पीपल बिलीव दैट ओ people only invest in iitians right and i, I was not an iitian i'm a philosophy major who got funding from top vcs mm. i understand this feeling right mm. but the point is that if somebody is investing their money without somebody having any product or traction or anything then yeah. who are you likely to pick yeah it's the same problem of arrange marriage mm. who are you likely to pick when the amount of information available yeah is who are you to- who are you likely to trust so when you are back in the jungle you would trust a face that looks like you or is similar to your you recognize or a face that is looking at you when it's speaking to you and today you will you will decide on the available data and that is the interesting question people don't we don't have the time to properly understand each and every other human being on earth we don't have the time to evaluate each and every one we have to look at signals if i see you and if i have no idea who you are i have to look at your clothes i have to look at your glasses i have to look at your bag what else do i base it on if i have to make a decision about you right i have to make a decision after asking you certain questions now what do i ask you i'll ask you about your life i'll ask you about where you studied there has to be some parameters of judgment yeah that's yeah. what trust is based on um or absence of negative signals absence of threat yeah so let's take examples of where i will check for positive signals and where i look for elimination of negative signals for example um i am going to a a trip and i have to buy a bottle of water mm. uh obviously i look for familiar ones but in absence of that i will still pick one versus taking money that were bought from the tap okay. right uh so the point is that trust over there is not as much about let's say getting married mm. it seems to be a much larger decision right mm. so the decisions applied is not heavy but soft enough and therefore you will see many bottles are designed just like the slurry yeah Sure, Bill Seri is a very famous brand, by the way. Yeah. So the thing is that that's enough. Yeah. So, yar, abhi isme aur kya karenge research? It's. But let's say uh, if you name yourself uh, Melon Musk, nobody's gonna get married to you. <laughs> sure. So when we when we talk of brands, a lot of trust psychology is already known. and brands do try and position themselves according to this like how do i appear most trustworthy so tell me as somebody who's been in the industry for so long is that approach sustainable this sort of working your way backwards ki let me appear trustworthy kind of fake it till you make it kind of approach to trust uh i don't think you can hack reputation hmm in fact every time you try to hack reputation it will be severely punished uh because uh 
every time you work yourself to get high status uh, by hacking reputation, uh, people around you will bring you down uh, because you've not really deserved it, right? Uh, yeah. And you'll see consistently people who try to hack a reputation always face a lot more challenge versus people who deservedly go up. Uh, let me give an example to think about. Uh, let's say uh, uh, you became popular without having skills. Yep. And because you just hung around with some really smart people uh, or with some really cool smart people, people like, oh, you are also somebody, right? And therefore, nepotism uh, sometimes fails miserably when you have no skills. Uh, because you can hack and get yourself three movies, but you'll not be able to sustain if you don't have the skills to mm. support it. So yes, uh, uh, you can try to hack it, but you need some substance to be able to pull it off. Back it off. Uh, I, I think trust in brands comes from four things. And I think uh, I've mentioned this multiple times uh, and I don't know where I got it from, but uh, it's a loose combination of four things. And presence of all is not required, but visible absence of one can make you mistrust, right? So one is mm. uh, consistency. Mm. If you're inconsistent, then it'll cause consistent mistrust. Let's say I behave in a certain way on certain days and different other days. And, and I'm not consistent in what I say or my lines or my promises. It'll cause mm. huge mistrust, mm. right? Second is... Uh, integrity right like people will quickly lose trust on somebody who shows low integrity in general mm-hmm. right uh, then competence right uh, imagine you are super trustworthy and i trust you but let's say you say Kanal, i'm gonna make you jump from the plane and i ask you do you know how to make people jump from the plane he's like no but trust me will not work so competence is a big factor to create trust and the last one is benevolence and so this is an interesting one where a lot of tribal trust comes from how much do you care for giving back, uh, building a bigger thing. And therefore, if you notice, our Tatas have generated a lot more trust mm. over years than many other conglomerates have because they've always had the mindset to create interesting uh, long-term giving back things. For example... Yeah. So many institutes like TIFR, Tata Research, Tata Hospital are all initiatives to give back, right? Uh, and, and what you see is that a lot of uh, our trust is uh, how they have treated their own employees. So you'll see every now and then uh, how they've handled their own team members, create natural trust in other people, yeah. right? Uh, and I think you can't hack this. You can't go ahead and uh, uh, tweet how I help this employee. Then again, it virtue signaling will kill the good part of it. But if I hear about this yeah. from somebody else, it will become a content that will spread uh, because people will be oxytocin is like I said in the past, like it's a Wi-Fi uh, uh, a hormone, right? Like uh, everybody feels it together. When you mm. see a good action done, uh, yeah. everybody stays connected. The group is happy. Good. Yeah. What is interesting is that evolutionary psychology has mixed up with economics and game theory is kind of where both of them meet. When we talk of trust. Game theory is where everything meets when it comes to <laughs> Right. So when we, when we talk of money, essentially money was uh, like a commodification of trust. Like instead of me trusting you, let let us put our trust in this abstract coin or this note, and that note will now be the bearer of trust. I think uh, uh, that's one way to think about it. But I think what we did is we trusted somebody who enforced that trust. Hmm. So if you go back to the history so of like a bank or a king or a nation, right? Right. So right. banks are much later. Kings enforce sure. their own currency saying that just in case of dispute, I will be the one who will give justice. Right? Sure. So use my currency and give me tax because I am the one who will solve your disputes. Right. Right. Uh, and I think that's an interesting way to think about money. But uh, as humans find more ways to 
trust each other they don't need the kings anymore right mm. so if the growth of gold in the past mm. uh was not born out of any king or any regime but humans figuring out a way to trust each other right but gold is harder to move away and take your wealth away along with because you'll get kept caught at the airport if you go with right. your gold yeah. uh and therefore you see birth of crypto mm. as an interesting way of interoperable trust moving in a different direction the only problem is there are so many religions to believe in in crypto right and and therefore you notice that every religion that became mainstream had one common factor a, a nation adopted it or a king adopted it mm. so elon musk <laughs> so dodge coin becoming big because yeah. elon adopting it right uh makes even a useless thing become real right uh or if a country let's take an example we 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 suddenly hear that us has accepted bitcoin as their interoperable currency right? right let's say you are in a country where you don't trust the regime let's say you are in russia right now right any mechanism that somebody gives you to move your wealth into crypto yeah. you like it because you can actually leave now uh and get your wealth now the thing is uh uh that's the whole idea behind interoperable trust that you can carry your storage of energy in form of money yeah. anywhere right so yeah. to me wealth is nothing but storage of energy so basically wealth is nothing but batteries mm. uh and and you can have batteries in many forms as long as somebody ex- exchanges that battery uh and accepts that as a currency you're fine so as we evolve the means of storing that uh, so wealth itself is storage of energy but then the keys to that storage would still remain in either the person which is the king or in gold which is a physical object but now it is stored in a code it yeah. is stored in the blockchain the the thing is that a uh, blockchain may or may not be able to ensure uh all types of transactions right for example let's say uh i was supposed to pay rent uh mm. and and we had a dispute so you are my landlord uh and there are so many nuances right a blockchain is not smart enough to say oh the rent is due no matter what but what if the clause says in the agreement that agar ac nahi chalega and and this will not happen then i cannot pay the rent or right. this building has uh, a a huge problem and i can't come to my flat Right. the thing is that you still need mechanisms to resolve disputes between human beings yeah uh, and and you can't enforce everything through a blockchain uh, which is over simplification that human disputes can be solved through computers then mm. then life mein aur kya chahiye tha right like right uh, uh, you can't resolve disputes so That's the nuances the same problem comes up in medicine all the time that uh, we sometimes get carried away by our own knowledge and we think that we have solved everything but most of the time uh, we still don't completely understand the problems that we are solving so just because some medicine that we have given has solved the issue does not mean that we understand every single step of it in some professions you are not even questioned because somebody doesn't even understand how to question you right uh, and therefore medicine as a profession you will see a lot of people will get to a a demigod status mm. because how do you ask a doctor who's taking care of your parent who's in icu mm. the black yeah. box right uh, yeah. and i think uh, that creates a lot of onus of responsibility on you uh, but also creates this uh, uh hazard where you could be kind of doing things and not be questioned for it and in the us uh medical malpractice and insurance and all that is a huge thing because yeah. the systems have evolved to uh sue and counter sue people and so on and so forth yeah here you are not going to sue a doctor for medical negligence because you don't understand enough and you trust yeah. them and this yeah. is again the point low trust society concentration on trust mm so you will see that uh it it uh demigod status of doctors is lot more prevalent in low trust societies uh this is very interesting this actually brings up a point of the advantage of trust i have a theory that in western medicine they are going to find out more and more that with this culture of suing and uh, basically anti trust 
the efficacy of medicine goes down. Yes. And I'm not sure how long it will take for this conversation to seep down into the everyday medical lingo and the conferences. But you need your patients to trust you when you're giving them the medicine and not sort of in a Sherlock Holmes kind of mode where, okay, let me catch the doctor making a mistake so I can sue him. It's not going to work. A lot of our medicine requires that the patient trust you. Uh, this is where it gets super interesting and super complicated, right? Um, hmm. All breakthrough progress happens when you are in in a mode of being one with something, right? And hmm. and and it'll cause some breakthrough in some ways, right? Uh, and and you'll experience something. But uh, if people have to be super cautious and follow procedures, for example, pilots hmm. are not allowed to go beyond their standard routines right and therefore they operate on a different spectrum of freedom to let's say a, a doctor does yeah right uh, and i think therefore uh, every time you try to uh, constrain a creative field by rules it will stop being creative Right. Imagine I tell you that music karna hai, lekin yehi bas char instruments se kar sakte. Hmm. Correct. Or, or you can use only these 200 words. Yeah. Or words. Right. Express yourself in your poetry. Right. Uh, and I think the remix that we do uh, across different things just disappears when we put too many rules. Hmm. Um, and just Interesting framework, uh, unrelated to this, but I should tell you what I read about this from Devdutt Patnaik. He has an interesting framework, which is uh, yeah. on one axis there is values, and on one axis is obedience, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do two by two, uh, it talks about drama is high on obedience, high on values, right? So you yeah. create that image for him. And then there is exact opposite, which is Ravan, which is low on values, low on obedience. Right. right? And then there is Duryodhan, which is uh, high on obedience, but low on values. Right? Oh, interesting. This is like, oh, so we have to end the whole thing and we can go home. But values is, it's not, it's by letter, not by spirit. Right, right. And then there is Krishna, uh, which is very high on values, but low on rules. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and right. therefore, some professions by design, if you expect the doctors to behave like Ramas and not like Krishnas, mm. the medical medicine field will stop evolving. Mm. Uh, yeah. But so, by design, uh, you expect the industry of pilots to have a lot more Ramas. <laughs> yeah, you don't want your pilot to be creative. Exactly, the point. Right. And, and I think... Uh, but if you see fighter jets and, and people who fly fighter jets, they are told yeah. to operate and become one with that fighter jet. And they By instinct. Yeah, they, they, they get that instinct and they become one with something. Right. So, so I think uh, there are many approaches to this, but I think uh, uh, the, there are magical things that happen when you completely trust somebody uh, to do something for you, right? And I think uh, uh, our, our, all of our human progress is because of this trust that we've had on people, on things. And uh, like, look at COVID. It, we came out of it, Sid. Like, yeah. like we are here. We are here. Like, yeah. there was a time where all of us had lost hope. Yeah. And we were like, shit, looks like there is no end to this. Yeah. Right? But we cracked the vaccine, got people vaccinated. We're back to life. Well and done, humanity. That's, and, and it's only because of trust. How many people have done any research on the vaccine? <laughs> yeah. To trust. I mean, this is the beautiful thing about the human society. Yeah. And the, the, I'll take it one step further. If you actually trust completely without any doubt in your mind, the neurochemistry in your brain changes. The way that you perceive information changes, the way that uh, you perceive your own pain, your own anxiety 
that changes. So if somebody that you trust tells you that you're going to be all right, or that uh, this medicine is going to work, the impact is very different. So that makes me wonder of the importance of trust in religion. Um, so uh, any belief, uh, religion being one of them, uh, has a unique ability to reduce your anxiety. Hmm. Uh, because it stops your brain from going all over the place yeah. and you're trying to seek answers to many things. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of people, astrology does that. Yeah. So a lot of people talk to their pundits regularly and say, Kya karna chahiye? Bolta hai, Are saat baje karna hai. Okay, damn it. Okay, done. My brain is not working. So like, all I have to do is 7 p.m. and my life will be better. Right. Uh, and surprisingly, you see superstitious people do well because they're a lot more deliberate about some of these things to make things work. Because they're like, how can things go wrong? I'm going to make it work. Yeah. Uh, and it's weird that how that reinforces good behavior. Yeah. Superstitious, right? Uh, <laughs> and and, and, uh, and I think uh, a lot of times uh, what religion does is allows us to kind of believe in the power of uh, cooperation and not believe in the power of violence and all the negative traits that we call as sins. And we keep a good scoring mechanism. to scoring points positive. Pap punya score mechanism yeah. is there in our head. With the imaginary concept of heaven and hell that we'll get to. Uh, yeah. That we all, in all worlds of the religion, believe in. And how did all religions come to the same game? Yeah. It's an interesting thing. But we do that with kids anyways, right? Like, if you do good behavior, you'll get chocolate. And if you do bad behavior, you'll get punishment. Yeah. Uh, it's just but a much more what, word. what a beautifully coded algorithm. Sometimes I am in awe of religion. This just the way that it has been structured and has kept humanity on track. I think more more fascinating thing was not existence of religion. The most fascinating thing is about scaling of religion. Mm. Some religions have scaled more than others, and there's beautiful things when you study the scaling of religion. Uh, you find interesting patterns to it. For example. Uh, religions that I managed to scale have always looked down upon uh, hypothetically uh, abortion mm. because they are so much obsessed about growing the cohort of the religion that says that you cannot stop the growth of this cohort right? or it will look down upon same sex uh, mm. uh, a relationship because it stops the growth of that cohort or it will uh, look down upon uh, a menstruation because it means you miss a chance of growing the cohort uh, and so on and so forth. And you see patterns of everything that we look down upon mm. are, are, are good growth mechanisms built into religion that scaled. Mm. Uh, and it's fascinating when you think about uh, how these things have been consistent across so many generations and so many religions. So today there is a very clear downturn of religion. Like the, the, the shift towards atheism is very prominent. In fact, I think in the US, it's the second biggest cohort, like after Christianity, uh, atheists. Uh, I, yeah. I, I don't think that is true. No? I don't think that is true. According to me, atheism is also a version of religion that people are believing in. <laughs> okay, that there is God and we are now together to hmm. believe that. But the best answer is, I don't know if there is God or there is no God. Hmm. Because you don't know. But no, there is no God. Right. It is, is nothing but, uh, you know, there's a beautiful thing called horseshoe theory. It says hmm. that the extreme left and extreme left are the same people. Right. right. So to me, strong believers of atheism are nothing but strong believers of religion. So they, they reach back tribe. to the same fanaticism. It's a tribe which has come mm. together to believe something. Right. Finding new tribes uh, to belong to. Right. Because that cannot be, you cannot escape that. Yeah. That wiring does not change. And, and, and so many generations have happened. Like systematically, you've seen so many religions humans have created and scaled and um, scaled down and changed and uh, 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 create varieties of it and renamed it 
yeah. borrowed some things from some other things like there was a beautiful thing i read somewhere which talked about how many religions seem to have same mythological stories behind it like how did all of them have the same thing in christianity and hinduism and all of that yeah. it's just that, uh, the origins have just been muddled uh, yeah. in some ways and people found their own variant of it uh, for example i went to bali and their version of ramayan is completely different i think they are more uh, matlab they do they do they say that uh, uh, ravan is the hero i i i did not pay attention but it, i mean got yeah. me yes that they they believe in that mm. it's a different story hmm. yeah so, i mean why not do you know that in india chess is the new religion not surprised about it <laughs> not surprised it has taken over do you play chess kunal i do uh, i'm not very good at it uh, hmm. uh and i wished i had picked up early in my life but uh i think it's a tribe creation by itself yeah there is the it's been incredible the revolution that has been happening over the last 2 years over chess um and actually i was considering using chess as a metaphor for understanding a lot of brain like neuroscience patterns so including eye tracking including pattern recognition and also trust so now there are games where two people can play as a team and it's called hand and brain so one person will just say the move but they won't they once one person will just say the name of the piece but they won't say where to move which move and the other person just has to trust that the first person knows what they're talking about and it's an incredible example okay. of mutual cooperation very interesting very interesting hmm. i think uh, uh creating trust uh, and bonds and uh is a fascinating thing at at workplace right uh when people play games together mm-hmm. their work becomes 10x better but workplaces yeah. frown upon people playing games right imagine people yeah. were playing chess middle of the day at yeah. work or mm-hmm. playing games for 30% of the day in the office premises right and it will be frowned upon but what if it creates bridges of trust yeah that you cannot even imagine uh it, it probably would do you know about synthesis the uh, school at spacex no so the employees at spacex came together to create a school called synthesis uh, based on elon musk's first principles thinking and their entire education system is based on games Love so it. every child will learn everything every skill required for them through games so they will have mock jury exams they will have mock uh, Uh, so they will pretend to be lawyers where they will argue cases and they found that eighth eighth graders can argue at the level of law students just by being trained properly wow as a game because for a child everything is a game pattern recognition is a game i love it i love it is it. crazy i spoke to their ceo i actually called him on for a podcast but you should we should definitely talk about that more how do we incorporate trust as a game for children if this is amazing if anything will make a change in our country that would be it this is so cool man i think uh, uh the f- education by design is done by people and done in a format that makes me resent it right <laughs> yeah uh, i agree and and we never made it fun and anything that is made fun is liked by the brain because it feels like progress right it feels like you're un- unlocking things and and figuring out new levels of the game but education never felt like that because it looks like that you're training for something and there is no war and you have no application of those skills right yeah yeah and exams never felt like an application it was more like okay do you remember it yeah. uh not applying it and i think the moment you create that application layer uh we learn so much faster right yeah. and i think uh, uh i i always believe that game designers should actively participate in education uh actually everything right uh uh the best professors you'll remember said are the ones who actually made things super interesting and super entertaining mm. right yeah. they're going to the class reduce your anxiety versus increase your anxiety 
and got you in a state to absorb more and learn more and i think that's why i always wonder one of the beautiful thing about covid was that you could learn from the best teacher on a zoom all together yeah uh what if physics was taught to the whole world by literally the best teacher ever yeah you can imagine just attending richard feynman's lectures and just yeah taking notes i'm saying that just like creating that yeah. so why do we learn from millions of teachers who may not be equally good at making me super interested in physics hmm now there is a conflict here of course because we want we do want teachers we want uh, but then we want to improve their teaching we want them to teach in a way that makes it if you if you see any if you go to any computer cafe right gaming cafe and you see a kid who has gone there for the first time the the speed with which he picks up a new game is insane yeah you know that on on the first second he doesn't know what to do and in half an hour he's playing it like he's been playing for the last 2 years yeah. so our brain has the capacity to absorb information very quickly and very efficiently yeah. we just don't know how to tap into it in fact uh i've seen that uh people who are born into internet or devices mm. they are just different right you should see a one year old playing youtube you'll be like blown away how they get it yeah uh, and and i think we are not realizing but we are having an education system that is so slow for them mm. their brain is compounding faster to devices exactly like how is the we still have the 10th and 12th standard and degrees yeah which was done when brains like said like you are so much younger than i am but i had no damn clue when i was 18 what was going on <laughs> yeah but now you meet a uh, uh, 18 year old they are already existential <laughs> <laughs> yeah they have figured themselves out and started questioning it already yeah which is great it usually took many many years to get there so <laughs> yeah i think uh, we we are accelerating <laughs> the power of compounding that is happening in them already and the education yeah. team is slow like imagine like most teachers struggle with tech mm. but they are like i'll just study it on youtube quickly done i only know the subject and i if i'm interested in it uh and that also brings brings you back to trust because they don't trust the system anymore they yeah. know that they can find out they can learn better from other sources i think that's where i talk about like competence right like we we start realizing like said when i was growing up we thought the elders knew their stuff and we respected them yeah but you were born in a generation where you saw them on whatsapp groups and you were like i can't believe this <laughs> yeah i never thought uncle would say this right and and covid was this massive iq test <laughs> i agree <laughs> yeah the number of people that you have to mute It was just you know, every day. I wonder if, like, are they really serious? Are they like, are they really saying saying these things? Yeah, WhatsApp forwards is a great uh, litmus test for yeah. IQ. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would definitely, if I were building a building, I would definitely check everybody's WhatsApp messages <laughs> for sure. <laughs> the beautiful thing about uh, WhatsApp and WhatsApp group is that there will be always a regression to mean. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, Kunal, I'm going to do one thing. I am going to play. Maybe not right now, but I definitely want to play chess with you on stream once. Sure. All right, and I'm going to show you something very cool. Uh, I'll show you how to use an eye tracker and then analyze your game later. What is incredible is that you will play a game, you will think you've made the best moves. and you will go and analyze it later and you'll realize that you didn't make a particular move because your eyes never went there wow interesting isn't that crazy and you would have made that move if only you saw it but you don't see it love it it's been it's been blowing my mind uh, so we are hey, going right? to do that uh, at workplace yeah i call it the problem of global maxima i have seen the best of the best leaders hmm. don't make the best of the best decisions because they do not go and scan the world on what how did people solve the same problem 
right. otherwise. And, and India has a very peculiar issue of not asking for help or searching for global maxima. Uh, we are constantly stuck in this uh, you have to be the best. Yeah. Of so I think this is exactly the same for me. Uh, but but uh, we should do some cool fMRI experiments also. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've already kept it. We should. You, we should you, you have to come to Bombay. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll come. And I think we should do this because uh, we should take some hypotheses and test uh, and start building our own thing. So I want to figure out a way to... Uh, get a lot of uh, maybe research funded help or whatever to mm. like, I think the culture of testing and creating hypothesis is just not there in the yeah. uh, country. If you have a mechanism for helping on that, just let me know. I'm happy to kind of support a few researchers here and there. Uh, just means uh, uh, enhance curiosity. I would love that. And I think the community would love that as well. There are, there are 250 people uh, here and everybody uh, yeah. it's crazy that people are up this late and yeah exactly are... and it's 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 crazier still that uh, you know in my in the mornings i put out reels talking about the importance of good sleep and uh, <laughs> here i am <laughs> ruining people's sleep but then incredible that so many of you are listening i hope you enjoyed this conversation this video will will go to members only so whoever is listening right now Congratulations. And uh, we'll edit this whole thing and put it up as a nice tight clip uh, later on. Uh, Kunal, there are there have been a lot of questions. Uh, Chad, I'm sorry that I didn't get to pick up on all of them. I, I tried to look at it, but I think the conversation was too absorbing. We will definitely have Kunal back. There are many topics that we could still discuss and we will have a chess stream. Perfect. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Good night, Kunal. Thank you so much for joining in. See you. Okay, chat. How are you guys? Apologies for not taking questions. I actually felt bad. I, I was looking down. Um, I was looking at you guys, but then, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really take everyone's questions. One second, let me just quickly adjust this and we will talk. Uh, was Suhani in the stream in the middle? I thought I saw, her, but then the chat just went by. Loved it, said, great, thank you, Arun, Chinmay, Harsh, Nikhil, Ravi, Meg, uh, Astha, Valdi saying this was great. Please don't make members only. Manish, don't worry, the whole, so the plan actually was that we will record this offline, okay. When uh, the plan was the it was like, we will offline record and then edit karke dal denge. And I said, uska kya matlab hai? at least live stream, to kar lete hai. let chat attend, let people at least be a part of the live conversation. And then later on, we will put it up as a video. So that's the that's the plan, guys. Don't worry. You'll get to see the whole thing again. So you're fine. You're fine. Uh, amazing. I, I'm, I'm really surprised that so many of you are here up awake till now. But great. I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you came. Uh, also, my channel's name has changed. It's now Sid Warrior. It just seems more right, you know. And that's it. I'll see you soon. I have a couple of very, very interesting videos lined up in the next two days. I'm not going to spoil the surprise. I'll just say it's something to do with the vlog. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Good night. Love you all. See you soon.